Good morning. It's good to be with you today. I'm as anxious to get to that barbecue as you are, so we all have the same goals in mind. In just a moment, I'm going to read from the book of Galatians. If you want to turn to meet me there, I will read a text out of Galatians chapter 5, a familiar text. But I'm glad to be with you today. It was, it dawned on me as Mary, my wife, and I drove over here last night from Locust Fork that it was 20 years ago this summer that I was a young man driving over here down to the end of Nisbet, or down this way on Nisbet Lake Road to meet a young Mike Oliver. Now, Mike and I have both put on our years, but uh, I have a long history with this church family. I appreciate who you are. I appreciate what you do in the world. I appreciate and follow what you do in this community, and I want to commend you. I could indeed almost just say amen to Rhonda's children's sermon and really be done with the text today, and I know some of you will say, well, then be on about it. <laughs> but Lamar gave me a check when I came in the door, and I don't want him to reclaim it at lunch, <laughs> so you'll have to endure me for a little bit. It's interesting that the text today, this is the epistle reading for the lectionary today, which is not made to always fit the secular calendar. So it is, it is uh, by happenstance that the text that we're going to be looking at from Galatians speaks to this issue of freedom, and particularly to the issue that Rhonda raised, talking with the young people about our spiritual freedom. Paul's letters, letters are interesting pieces, except for the Corinthians, they're fairly short and honestly are best read completely because they're not like the Gospels, which do tell stories that have some connection, but they're written like you would write someone a letter. They're written in whole thought. They're written in kind of a stream of conscience manner. And because they're letters, they're written with very specific things in mind. Each of the letters tends to take up one or two or three topics that Paul wants to address with these churches that he has helped birth. Thus is so with the Galatians letter. And I won't read the whole letter to you, but basically what has happened in the churches of Galatia is that people have come in, Paul himself a Jew, understanding what it meant to be a Jew and all that that involved to, to, to follow Judaic law, understands that in Christ we have a new freedom. Jesus said in John's gospel, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And indeed, the price that was paid for our spiritual freedom was a high price. And Paul addresses that. In almost all of his letter, he has a bit of a case statement. And I'm going to drop back a couple of chapters. If you want to join me there, you can. But I want to read something from starting in verse 19 of chapter 2 and grab a few verses in chapter 3, and then we'll deal with the main text. This is Paul, a very loyal Jew in his day. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through law, strong statement here, Christ died for nothing. You foolish Galatians, he says, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law? Or by believing what you heard, are you so foolish after beginning with the Spirit? Are you now trying to finish by human effort? Have you experienced so much in vain? If it was really in vain, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by your observing the law or by your believing what you had heard? Paul is dealing with the issue of what we call Judaizers. And you know the term. 
These were people who came in who were still attached to the old Jewish law and they, they were gook, they were cool, if you will, with this idea of Jesus. But they wanted to bring with them the Jewish law in, in, alongside it. They weren't telling the church at Galatia, you're not getting it at all right. Paul has told you something. They were telling them, oh, but you've got to do more. You know that freedom you have in Christ? Well, you've got to observe the law too. Now, if you want to proof text this, you can make a case for it. Jesus said in Matthew's gospel, I have come not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. So you say, well, the law is valid, but wait. Jesus also said, when the woman that was brought to him caught in adultery, not the Levitical law says that the man and the woman shall be stoned to death, what did he say? If you haven't sinned, go ahead, throw the first stone. So there's always this larger context in which it works. Paul continues in chapter 5, verse 1. It is for cre freedom that Christ has set us free. Now that kind of sounds like a, 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 a double positive, if you will. But Paul is saying it is for the sake of freedom itself that Christ has set us free. It was not by accident. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. And then turning over to verse 13, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Every sentence is a sermon, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command an Old Testament, in fact, a Levitical text. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. And then it goes on down in, in verse 19, we pick up there. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Now, this is an interest kind of a, what I'll call a pumpernickel sandwich. Because it begins, at least for me, I'm not a big fan of pumpernickel. It begins things that we don't tend not to associate ourselves with. Well, I would never do these. And then there's something in the middle that we kind of all struggle with, I think. And then there's some more at the end that, that are also consequential as well. But it's, all I'm saying is it's easy to excuse this list. But don't listen to the ones that you can rule out real quickly. Listen to the ones that may be speaking to us. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft. Now, it gets wild, kind of off rail. I don't expect there are any witchcraft folks in this building. Right after that, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, Dissensions, factions, all over my toes, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I'm going to let that passage stand on its own merit. But, Paul says, these familiar words, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have been crucified, have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited provoking and envying each other. The practice of faith. That's what I'd like to talk with you about for just a few moments this morning. It's a broad subject. It's a lifetime activity. But what Paul is speaking to the Galatians about is how they practice their faith. 
And very specifically, Paul is saying to them, enjoy the freedom that Christ gave you. And if you enjoy that freedom, then the long list of don'ts, if you will, will take care of themselves and you will produce things in your life that are pleasing to everyone. There's not a thing, what we call the fruits of the Spirit. I don't know anybody that would find any objection with any of those. Person of faith, they're not. Does anybody not appreciate patience or kindness or the fact that we are gentle or exercise some measure of self-control? Those things are universally appreciated if they're not always universally practiced. The practice of faith. I know there's some musicians in this room. We've already heard from them. No doubt there are artists, seamstresses, craftsmen, people who do all sorts of things that require practice. How many of you enjoyed homework in school? Not many. But the truth is, those 35 math problems we had to do at night that seemed senseless because once you got the concept, you got the concept right, but they were not senseless. It took practice. It took doing the same thing over and over, what keyboardists call muscle memory, so that your, your fingers do it without thinking, or craftsmen, or artists. We have to practice our faith. And by that, I don't just mean show up at church on Sunday, be here early for Sunday school, be here on Wednesday night and be involved. Those things are all important. We have to do the hard homework. We have to do the things that don't come out as an assignment, do this this week and this tonight, but the things that Scripture requires of us. And while there are any number of things that can commend that, and I'm not much of a three points in a poem guy, but I do have three points this morning about practicing our faith. Three points about trying to follow what Paul said to do. Because our Sunday school teachers, our parents, our grandparents, our preachers, anybody that we look to for spiritual guidance can't just package it up and give it to us. Nobody can package anything up and make you a musician or an artist or an athlete or a craftsman or anything else. We all understand we have to practice. So what do we do to exercise, to practice our faith? At least these three. First of all, we have to open the windows of our hearts and our minds and our soul to God's Spirit. If you read the whole letter of Galatians, Paul contrasts two things. The movement of the Spirit and the rather stale works of the law. And clearly, Paul is saying to the Galatians, if you listen to these Judaizers and you try to hang on every Levitical passage and make sure you dot all your I's and cross your T's, you're going to die in the faith. But if you listen to the Spirit, if you open your mind and your heart and you listen to the Spirit, then different things happen. And that's not just about what happens here on Sunday. You can listen to the Spirit if you're an outdoors person in creation. You can listen to the Spirit while you're engaging in community conversations or talking with a neighbor on the front porch. God's Spirit is not limited by space. But we have to listen to it. So much of what I think we preachers do is not so much to tell you things, but to try to raise all of our cranky windows and let the Spirit blow through. I don't know what the Spirit has to say to you this morning. The second thing that we have to do is we have to take this word to ourselves. Now, what do I mean by that? We've lived at least for close to 100 years in a church, in a, in a, a church globally that has tended to look to the academic theologians or the trained theologians to be the experts on the Bible. And I'm all for trained theologians. And I love the academy. And I believe in degrees. But we have to absorb this for ourselves. With our windows open and the spirit moving, we have to hear what this says. As I pointed out in the earlier illustration, you can find a proof text to prove anything that you want to prove if you just want to make your point. I tell people it's like paying tic-tac-toe. If you know anything about tic-tac-toe and have any experience at tic-tac-toe, it always ends in a draw, right? 
Well, that's, you know, you give me a scripture and I give you a scripture and you give me a scripture and I give you a scripture and we can go with that all day long. We have to absorb it. I can't give it to you. You can't give it to me. That's part of what Paul's saying. Paul's saying these people are trying to say, take you back to a day when it was much more transactional. They're trying to take you back to a time when they could tell you what's right and what's wrong and don't have to think about it. So we have to open ourselves to the Word. And finally, and maybe most, well, I don't know most important, all of these are required. But in this day and time, we have to open ourselves to the world. Now, I'm old enough to remember CB radios. And some of you that maybe weren't part of the CB craze, you've had a two-way radio where it had a squelch knob. And you had to get the squelch turned just right so you could hear clearly. We live in a day and time where there's an awful lot of squelch in our world. There's an awful lot of noise. And to be able to listen to the world and to be able to speak to the world, we have to be able to tune that noise out. And we have to tune it out of our speech. We have to tune it out of our actions so that people can hear these basic things clearly. Paul did not say to the Galatians, do these things, these nine things, be gentle, be kind, be loving, be faithful. He didn't say do those nine things and you will be spirit-filled. What did he say? He said the fruit of the spirit. Be spirit-filled and these things will happen. These things will come to be. It's challenging. It's challenging right here in your community. There are people that if you could grow a sanctuary four times this size and fill it to the walls would still never make it in the doors. And to speak to that world, we have to speak with clarity. And we have to be open. And we have to be authentic. And we have to be loving and kind and gentle. And to do all of those things of which none of us is capable of alone we have to have the spirit. We have to listen. We have to hear what the word says to us. And we have to hear and speak to our world. You'll hear this phrase maybe a lot this week and not always in this context. But Paul does indeed say, let freedom ring. Pray with me. Dear God, we are grateful. We are grateful that the 243rd birthday of our nation is coming up this week and all the blessings that flow from that. But more than that, we are grateful for the freedom we gained 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ took upon himself that cross and paid a price so that we'd never have to pay it again. In our day and time, there are all kind of people who would try to cheat us from our freedom, who want to draw reins around us and say, you can't do it that way, you can't be that way, you can't think that way. And we can't fight them every one. But we can claim our freedom in Christ. We can open ourselves to your spirit, to the example of Jesus, to the spoken word laying flat on the page. And we express that freedom, that loving freedom, to the world around us. May we indeed know the truth, and may the truth always make us free. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.